know, slightly different approach. The, the, the panel before is incredibly poignant, and I think it's hard not to uh, address some of the issues that come up. Um, Toby lands in a, in a very different place in terms of the art. It's, um, it's about the middle ground, about the higher ground, about finding the humanity that exists uh, in everyone. So this, it, I think it's, you know, in terms of a mindset and an ethos, um, and the notion of a, of a sacred space, what does that mean? Um, how, does one, how does one find that? How does one create that? What does it mean to enter a sacred space? What is the what are the dimensions and the character of a sacred space, and, and how does that um, influence potentially behavior? Um, the difference between, <clears throat> say, resistance and acceptance, um, there's a vast gap in, in between, and I think that's what we're talking about um, presently. You want to say I want to say one thing. I think it was very moving. I left my class out early so I could come to the uh, first panel, uh, panel right panel right before, and I sat here, and um, I, I, I lecture and I teach a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm named for my uncle, whose name was Arthur Kahn, who was one of the first four Jews killed by Hitler in 1933. He was a medical student and an artist. Um, he was at, as, at Würzburg University, and um, he had gotten a grant to go to, the, um, to study in Edinburgh. And then he was in Edinburgh and then got another grant to do early cancer research at the Sorbonne. And he went back to Germany just to pick up his papers. And that was the day that Hitler uh, became chancellor. And he and seven students, uh, four Jews and three Christians, spoke out against Hitler as a fascist. Um, there's a book called Hitler's First Victims that came out two years ago. And it's about these four Jewish students who were then killed. Um, so I never do anything in my life without thinking that I'm not only representing um, myself, but I'm representing him. And one of the speakers who was here today is 21 years old. My uncle was 22 years old, um, and he was killed. So it was very powerful to see that image that he showed of the swastika and the Jew. My uncle was not, I mean, my family was all observant, but he was a medical student, and he was very clear about being a medical student and loved art. So if I talk about sacred spaces, I can't separate myself as a child of Holocaust survivors, as somebody I always feel I'm representing my uncle as well as myself. But it takes me on a very large journey. And I've been blessed by meeting so many righteous people of the world, both Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, and obviously Jews, that I've become very interested in creating sacred spaces and what that means. I'm not for a moment saying that remembering where I come from, and my wife is here, the writer Nessa Rappaport, we talk about this all the time, and I think until recently our children didn't understand why we talked about it so much, and now all three of our children talk about my background and are we waiting too long? I mean, my grandmother, my whole family um, were German Jews. One side of the family was there for 400 years. They were the ones who lost two of their children, uh, and they came here in 39. The other ones were English, Dutch, and German. Hitler becomes chancellor. She's on a skiing trip. She says to her husband, call up the nanny. We're not going, and they were very wealthy. We're not going back to Germany. And she saves the entire family. I always thought I was more like her, and now I turn out to be much more like the Khans. I'm, I'm not ready to leave yet, and I still think there's hope in this country. I, I, I love America. I think we have major problems, but I don't think America and Germany are the same. Nothing repeats itself exactly. So that's where you saw my hand up, and I didn't want to spend any moment of your time, so I decided to use the first minutes of our time to just say you can't forget where you come from, but you also, as you said so well, you have to try and do something positive. And I, I'm the only person of faith at the School of Visual, I teach at the School of Visual Arts, I'm the only person of faith, a faculty member. So I get all the Muslim students who don't want to work from a figure, 
and all the Catholic students, and once in a while I have a Jewish student who doesn't want to work for a new model, and everyone knows that I'm that person. So, so let's talk about that. Right, so when we talk about faith and we talk about um, Toby's work, he's inherently an abstract artist, very different from what we can see. Um, what does it mean to be an abstract artist of faith? You know, how do you create images that are optimistic and have a certain optimism and humanity built into what they are? And this is something that, that you've been figuring out since I got to know you. Um, I should say that we met here in the early 80s, in the 92nd Street Y, so being back here um, is fitting. And shortly after we, we met, uh, I went to Toby's studio, and, and some of the first things that I saw were these little shrine-like artworks. And I wasn't quite sure exactly what they were. I was, it, was, it was an immediate kind of stroke of curiosity. What are these things? They seemed diminutive and small, but they seemed architectural. They uh, seemed in their own right holy, but yet there was a secular envelope around them. They had the potential to grow. And I think more than anything else, it's something that uh, you know, eventually we saw them come to fruition. So let's put it on the first slide, if we can. And it wasn't until the early 90s that Toby actually got the opportunity. Let me make the light a little bit. Yeah, let's dim if we can. I'm talking to you, the crowd, but I really should be talking. This is my conversation with Toby. We've been talking since the 80s, so this is like what we do all the time. Um, so, yeah. it took a number of years for the little maquette. And you were, you were building these shrines. Um, they proliferated like children, even before you had children. Um, and then you have the opportunity, and the opportunity came through this amazing patron. So I, I, you know, let's talk about both the, the object, the site, and Jane Owen. So, uh, so I, I grew up observant. I, I've been observant all my life. Um, I went to yeshiva for 12 years, and then I studied acting for one year at Tel Aviv University because I needed a little, a little break. Um, and then I went to yeshiva for three more years. <laughs> Um, and I felt very lucky that I, I, I met great rabbis, including, I don't know if you know, Rabbi Mittal. Um, and my first exhibitions were when I was in Israel. Um, my, I went to Hunter and Pratt, and my first um, uh, piece that I did was called Holes for the Dwelling. As a little kid, I went to shul, and I still do, every Shabbat. And I would get bored, which I still do. And uh, my father would say, why don't you read about the Mishnah, which is the tabernacle. You love structures. And it was a godsend, literally, <laughs> because I would read about what the Holy of Holies looked like. I am a Kohen, I'm a priest, I'm a priest family. The concept of making something that only one person goes into, if you don't know what it is, in the Holy of Holies, the high priest went in there once a year, and the amount of attention. I always laugh with people, I happen to keep kosher, it's one sentence. The Mishnah, if you care about footage or space in the Torah, it's chapter and chapter about how to design a space that's holy that only one person is going to see once a year. I think that's kind of cool. Um, and I still think it's kind of cool, and it's quite a ways away. So I started making these shrines that were based on the culture, the Holy of Holies. You know, that, that's interesting me. I did it from um, uh, 1976. Um, and then I was very lucky, I had a show at the Guggenheim in 85, I was one of nine artists in that show, and I met uh, Peter Sels and uh, Father Terry Dempsey, who's a Jesuit priest, who wrote part of his doctorate on artists who were interested in the sacred, and I was one of them. And uh, he told me he had a museum show opening, he opened a museum in St. Louis called Mokra, and he said, would I go to the opening? And I said, we had at that time one child, and I said, no, I really can't do this because if you go, I'll introduce you to Peter Sells and I'm, I'm coming. So Peter Sells was the curator in Roma in the 50s. He was very interested in art of the sacred. He did Running Fence by um, Christo. He, he did many and was very interested in German expressionist artists. And I always have found him fascinating. And Terry had said to me, he really likes your work. So at that opening, I'm sitting there talking to 
Peter, and he says he's going to give me a solo museum show that will travel the country. And I'm like in heaven, and in walks this woman, wears no makeup, very modest looking woman. She looked like a nun. Her name was Jane Blanfer Owen. And Jane introduced herself to me. She came over to me after she saw my small shrines and said, You know, you're a wonderful artist. And you know, on and on and on. But I was talking to Peter, and I didn't want to lose that, so I said, thank you so much for so nice meeting you. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> At the end of the um, dinner, uh, Jane Dillenberger wrote the book. Uh, she was a theologian in Berkeley, and I met her when I showed her John the Bruin. said, you're the luckiest young man. I said, I know. You know Peter just said he was going to give me a show. And she said, no, you just met a blacker. And I said, I did not meet a blacker. The blackers have the Houston Museum of Fine Arts. The Dimoniels, the Blathers, and the uh, Astors were the three major collecting families at that time in America. And she said, well, Jane is a Blather, so I go over to Jane and I say, Jane, I'm so sorry, I had no idea you were to them. I was so impressed with you because you don't need patrons and collectors. You need art historians. I'm going, no, 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 I need patrons. I'm not. And Jane became the, my, my major patron uh, until she died a few years ago one of the greatest human beings I've ever met, who was a devout religious person. She was a Christian, but she was a devout religious person, and she saw in my small shrines that I really believed in God. And it's the only major commission I've ever gotten, or patron I've ever gotten, because I believe in God, which I love. Um, and she had seen this small piece and said, why don't you do one of these? You know, they all were under 12 inches. She really was fascinated that they were based on holiness. And she said, I basically own a town called New Harmony, Indiana. Her husband was Robert Dale Owen, First Utopian Society of America. She had commissioned um, uh, Philip Johnson to do the Ruthless Church there. She had commissioned uh, Richard Myers to do the atrium. She commissioned John Lipschitz to do the interior of, I mean, she just really was an art patron. And enabled me to do this. I want to get the stone um, from Italy. And she goes, no, I want everything from America. So the stone is granite from South Dakota. She let me fly back and forth in her plane to pick the right work. And I wanted a piece of granite because it had mica chips in there. And I like the way the mica hits the light. I also believe in God's presence everywhere. And on the top, you see a line coming through it. And she wanted a place that young people could get married in. It has become a place that many, many people marry. It floods once a year. It's by the Wabash River. And I picked that place because my teachers always said to me, I, I studied with uh, many teachers who say a sculpture should be something that changes all the time. So I figured if it floods once a year for a month, that changes quite a bit. And um, so once for one month, you can't marry there. For the rest of the year, they have wheat fields in the back. You bought that piece of land as well. So this was my first large outdoor piece. And because of her, I've done over 30 uh, pieces. She was, she really jumped in the water and said, "Just go for it." Uh, so, so it, uh, it, the because it's in the landscape, you know, bring, brings up an interesting uh, question of the you know the landscape has been a very big. I mean, in addition to the text and you know, Jewish text, the landscape has been a very large um, influence as to how you've approached it. Um, assimilated it and then created you know, your own kind of impressions of it abstractly. So this commission gave you that opportunity to actually place an object in the context of a landscape. So I, I, I recently had a show at the museum in Florida called Aura based on how we're destroying the planet. Uh, and it was images that I did uh, in Costa Rica and Panama and all the places that and I believe, as a religious person, we have to care about nature, and we have to care about landscape, and we have to understand that the land is given to us. We are only here for a short time, and that I, I believe God wants us, or whatever you want to call that, wants us to be taking care of the space that we're given, rather than destroying it. So all of my images, a landscape. I do not ever have people in the landscape. The people might become part of it, but I'm very interested in what landscape means. You know, if you apply the story of creation, 
than the separation of heaven and earth and water and sky and all those things are really what fascinates me and I remember when I met um, Doug um, he took me up to his grandfather's farm first of all I never met a Jew who owned land it was like dirty crabs right I, I went to see this it was up it was in um, upstate New York Hudson Valley New York Hudson Valley New York and I kept looking at this land and you know, I felt like that Woody Allen movie with the little piece of land in his hand. I, I went, I can't believe it. Land, you know, like my family were all refugees. You know, land was not a big thing we had. I mean, people, my grandparents came with just the clothing on their backs, and I really found it fascinating that his grandfather had this large amount of land, and I started doing a lot of my early paintings uh, were based on the landscape of his grandfather because you could sort of see hills, and it was just beautiful. And there were brooks and all this that came through the space. And I, it's now 40 years later, and it still fascinates me in a very different way. We were in Iceland. And my wife and I were in Iceland last summer, and we just couldn't get over the landscape. And I, I think that is a Jewish, not only Jews, but that is something about looking at the glory of creation in, in that way. And so, when I went to the studio after Toby had been to upstate New York and had started creating based on what he saw, I immediately, I, there, what struck me immediately was this process of incredible distillation and essence. And so it wasn't about a literal replication of the landscape, but it was about something else that it had run through him in a way and then had come out um, as a work of art and as an image uh, where the essence of the thing remained. And I found that unbelievably fascinating. And I think if, if I mean, one thing, a thread that runs through the work is this distillation process um, and an attempt to seize what is the essence of the subject, whatever that might be. And we'll see that as we, as we run through the slides. We'll also see that th this, this notion of sacred space has a spectral quality to it. There are so many variations on it. So, Toby, let's, let's talk about this commission. Um, one, because it, 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 um, it's not an easy commission to pull off. <clears throat> Perhaps describe the circumstances and some of the challenges that came up. So I, I, I've done a few Holocaust memorials. The first was in New Jersey, the JCC in Tenafly. And um, I got a phone call um, from uh, the city uh, art administrator of the city of La Jolla. And they said, um, we're interested in someone doing a Holocaust memorial. We got your name. Um, we have turned down the piece that, it, so this is on public land, but the Holocaust memorial was paid by Holocaust survivors, children. Uh, the issue was, because it's not public land, you couldn't say the word Jew. You had to say survivors of the Holocaust. It was a very complicated commission because the piece that they were going to have was somebody who, and I don't think this is negative, it just was a fact, somebody who was not Jewish, and that artist looked at Holocaust memorials and decided to do a broken star of David and train tracks. Um, you know, broken train tracks. And there's a kindergarten in there. You know what I mean? Like, and I thought, obviously, the committee said, you can't put this here. So I got, the first thing I got was I tried to get more land, which every artist will do. <laughs> so originally, I got much further. They wanted a yellow line around there because the city, when you have public property, you have to have something separating where the parking is and I went like, you can't have a yellow line around the Holocaust Memorial. Please don't do that to me. And then we had a committee meeting through the city and we agreed that the yellow line could be, and I didn't photograph it, on the sidewalk in front of you. Uh, so you don't see that. The other thing is, um, can we go back to the other one for a minute? So it's a kindergarten and there's a library above for a lot of different things. And I wanted to make something that would tell the story, but that would not freak out people that were going in there every day. Um, so I wanted there to be 
water going through there, but again, because they're children, you have to go through all these legal things in the city. It can't be more than an inch uh, because kids could drown that way. All the stones there had to be glued down because you can't tell if you have a problem with kids swallowing things. I wanted an olive tree, which turned out to be the hardest thing to get, but I couldn't get one with pits, so I had to find an olive tree that was a hybrid. Yeah. And that was my, the most, that was the hardest part of the whole project. You think that really had the project, that was the problem. And then I, I really wanted to include everyone who lost family in the Holocaust. This was the frightening part. So I put up, in all the newspapers, we put up ads that for $18, I found someone to pay for all the marking of the names. So we just did $18 so that it would be high as life. And I wanted there to be something for, we had, over 10,000 people. And the saddest part were they all were Jews. And they, remember I told you they wouldn't let me put Jewish on here, but there was no one in La Jolla. I know there were many people who died who were either anti-Nazis or gay people or gypsies. But in this, it was all that. And and then I wanted to have every name on there. And in, in the Torah, it says, Allah made our shalosh the earth, and the world stands on three things. So I used the number three in a lot of my projects. So I didn't need to have these three times three, which is nine, but every name. And then we had to take a vote of what we should have on the top. And it said Zachor. And then it says in, in, in Polish, Gedat and remember. And then we list every person. And on this, and, and that is a, I wanted originally to be an eternal flame, but I couldn't have a flame because it's on public property. So we had water going through, and it's basically like Mother Earth or a woman holding out for water to you know feed the ground. And on all the rocks, we have all the camps where people were taken from. So every rock has a name of a camp that were, and, and then on another wall, I decided it was very important to talk about the righteous Christians who saved some of the Jews in Malaya. So there's another wall. You don't see it here, but on the other wall, um, it says all, oh, and it was, that was very powerful. A lot of those people came to the dedication. And on this wall, thanks to my amazing wife, we had to find a way to tell the story of the Shabbat with it not really mentioning the Jewish problem. Uh, so she put down crystal. She put, we, we figured out ways to say every law that they will put into account. That's what that is. And then she took a quote from Isaiah, uh, Isaiah of you know telling the story too. So and then it goes to when the Americans uh, freed you know the, the, the people. So th this was a very moving, very moving piece for me. And uh, I have to say, making Holocaust memorials and meditative spaces like that is so close to my heart because I always feel that my family who perished never had a chance to have this. I find one I find this project one of the most poignant and poetic um, because you enter it and it's there to elevate your spirit. Um, you begin to see uh, the painterly side of Toby's work. You also you also see quite clearly that everything is fair game for this artist in terms of making things, and that given half a chance he would be able to like Kurt Schwitters, he'd probably end up making his entire house over again um, in a most loving way. So the slide doesn't do the objects any justice whatsoever because they're lovingly made, layered with paint. Um, color is incredibly important even when it's subdued. But that the total effect as you walk into this kind of space is one of peace and, and not solitude, but uh, contemplation. Um, to maybe talk about how this came about because it really was a wonderful linkage in the chain of um, sacred spaces. So um, a father, uh, um Smith, Walter Smith, uh, is a Jesuit priest who saw my work at the uh, Albright Knox and at the uh, Newburger on my sky and water installations. And um, I met him through a, a, a rabbi friend of mine. And um, 
she had told him that I do these spaces and he was building new space and he had a chapel and he said, I want a sacred space for people to sit in and meditate. Um, and as soon as I met him, I'm like, wow, that's great. What do you want? And he goes, well, you're the artist. You tell me what you want. I said, well, I'm Jewish and our faith community, um, you need uh, a, a 10 people for a minion. Let me make a space for nine people because that way you're not going to compete with your chapel and this will just be a meditative space. You know, so he said, great. I said, well, I'm very interested in light. Can I break through the ceiling? And he goes, not unless you want to go to the next floor. And I said, well, that won't work. So um, I said, do you mind if I change the space? And um, I'm a huge fan of Doug Wheeler and uh, of uh, all the light artists. Um, Sorry, Bob Irwin. Yeah, Bob Irwin. I love Bob Irwin and, and James Terrell. And many people know who he is, but I think they're all equally great. And so I immediately lowered the ceiling uh, uh, three feet and, and made light that could be um, daylight, uh, evening light. And I asked if we could have doors that could close so when you're in the space, you feel like it's a meditative space and you're totally enclosed. And since she's not alive anymore, one of my favorite rabbis that I've ever met was Rabbi Rachel Cowan. Um, and I remember when Rachel came to see the space right after it was built, and she came in and she said, do you mind if I turn off the lights on Rabbi Rachel? I love it with the lights off. And she goes, I really find it much more soothing with no light and with just the ambient light that comes through these doors. So um, again, I told you three is very important to me. So all the walls are, really, I want you to feel like you're in water. In, in every faith tradition, water is very important. And I wanted you to feel like you were in a, a sacred space that was about healing and water. In, in, in the Jewish tradition, a mikvah, you know, is a place that you go to. In all faiths, that's the case. And this was the funniest part of the whole thing. So uh, Father Smith said to me, I love all the, you know, beautiful water, but I'm a priest. I need something to go to. Uh, you got to put something in there. I said, all right, how about an island? And he goes, okay, that's fine. So on both sides of the walls, there, on one side, there are two islands because I didn't want to pick only one. And, and the chairs, um, I worked for Joe Papp at the public. Um, I did sets for Liz Suedos, and I, I got very interested in um, the type of uh, leather you can put over the phone that your body keeps your impression after you leave the room. So if you sat in the room, when you walked out of the room, your body imprint would stay on the, the actual phone and the leather until five minutes later. So while you were in the room, you were really present. And I didn't want any place for books, but again, Father Smith said, you need books, so I made a, a, a library in a small, uh, you'll see in the front, in the first picture, if you go back one, that's to hold a Tanakh, a New Testament, and the Quran. And if you want to carry, and then they also have all other books, you have to bring it in, but they left nowhere to put it. So you'd have not there, but I really wanted you to get into the space and see what quiet meditation was all about. Um, it was very powerful, and, and it was right after 9 11, and, and it was many, many people went there. In fact, at one time, you had to wait online, uh, which is not the case anymore, too, because I wouldn't let, and they had it in their corporate offices. You'd have to write down when you want to go in. I love the idea of the lights being off too, Toby, because I think of a, a Terrell and in Houston where you know your eyes adjust and as they adjust they begin to see things that under under harsh light or um, more intense light they wouldn't be seeing. It's a very different mood. Okay. So when I was at the Old Bright Knox, Toby and I did a show in, in two thousand where I asked him to come and commandeer an entire gallery, which was a rather large gallery in this older 1905 neoclassical structure. And we talked a lot about what the room should feel like and the character of the room. Um, and essentially, he transformed it, uh, which was a, a major challenge because, you know, and, and likewise here at the University of Maryland, we're talking about art in, a, in the proverbial white box, you know, which is how the art world perceives so much art. And while the white box is neutral, in theory, it's not neutral in tangibility. 
quickly so that when you go to install in the white box, um, you're immediately challenged. So the installation here draws from what we had done in um, Buffalo. But Toe, talk about the challenges of, because in Buffalo, like the meditation space that we just saw, the canvases were monumental. And it was a little bit like the Rothko Chapel. So when you walk into the Rothko Chapel, you are, you're humbled immediately because of the size of the works that surround you. This is a little bit different. Um, and Toby, maybe you can talk about that. So I, I'm, I'm going to be doing a, a, a project now for the Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia. And I'm doing a series of 15-foot outdoor sculptures. And then I'm doing interiors of the two canvases. And I'm doing interiors to uh, mark different buildings and for different um, uh, purposes, an emergency room, cancer treatment, all different things. And um, this was a project I became fascinated with, is that, if, and I did this for NYU's lobby um, downtown at the Sloan Kettering. I think sky and water is healing. And what I've done is I've photographed, these are all based on real places. Every piece that I do is based on a photograph. That I've taken. Some of them are because of smog. Uh, I showed at the museum in El, in El Paso, Texas, and if you look to Mexico, uh, you see that fourth painting on the top. Um, that is the color at night because of all the smog and uh, the desert. So these are not fictitious. These are all based on places that I've seen, and I wanted to do something where the. Uh, so this is the, the first one that I've done. That the horizon is always the same. Uh, it's very powerful that he's here, but Richard McBee wrote a piece on this show with the Newberger and talked about the fact that when you say Shimon Esther, one of the prayers you say, and you can say it all the time, and each time you say it, you hope it's new. I, I've been doing sky and water paintings for uh, over 40 years, and I still find it so powerful to see how just two colors work off of each other. I mean, what that means, and I made this for that size space in the museum, and now that's going to be, there's a wall being built that will, it'll fit this piece perfectly. So, um, it's different when you sit in front of something, and as Doug said, when um, I want only one bench in the space, obviously this is going to be a lobby of a hospital, so it's not going to be only one bench. But in the seating area that I did for NYU's hospital, we have small chairs around there. They're not as many. There are only six uh, larger paintings there. But it, it's that idea that you can uh, think and dream on. I've done quite a few hospices as well. And recently, somebody told me they went to the hospice that I did in, in, in Riverdale. And they said, and I did that also 15 years ago, I hope that it stays, it works for every person having to use it. So, um, yeah. So I don't think every space has to be totally enclosed. I guess that's what I'm saying. This is a really great example of how inherently utilitarian but sacred object is transformed even further. Um, your approach to Judaica and you know, Jewish objects and sacred objects has always been incredibly creative, um, and it's not about accepting what's been done, but rather reinventing what could be done. So the, the naming chairs are part of that rather now, rather long and prolific history. So I don't know if that Sean and Bach for the birth of the daughter, they weren't in, in Sephardic communities, they always had something in the German communities, the German Jewish communities they had, but when my wife and I were expecting our first child. We didn't know if we'd be a boy or a girl. And I told my wife I want to do something if we have a son for a kisesha, a circumcision chair. And she said, if you're doing something for a son, what about our, if we have a daughter? And I said, OK, uh, I, let me think of that. And I don't like doing things that are the same, so I didn't want to do a single chair. So at that time, my mother was still alive. Nessa's mother is still alive. But if I decided to do chairs for my wife and my the two mothers. Um, it was a very powerful experience. Uh, 
and I made them. Uh, many years later, the Shaken family had had twins, and they said, can we use your baby gaming chairs? And I said, it's in a museum show in California. And they said, well, would you make new ones? And I said, let me think about it. And then they said, well, would you do three chairs again? For I said, no, 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 don't think that way anymore. Now I'm much more interested in the fact that there were four imaok, there were four matriarchs. The only thing I will do that's the same is the design of the chair, if you see, um, there's a saying, by Israel, that when a child is born, they hopefully will build a house together. So on the bottom of the chairs, that's not a structural decision, it's a visual decision. I want them to feel like almost a chupa or a, a little house under the chair, and the front legs of the chair and the back legs of the chair don't meet. So if the child, when the child comes into the world, she can bring her past with her. I love what that young artist said this morning about you have your own baggage. I want my kids to have the baggage that there were a lot of families that came before them. I don't want the negative baggage, but I want them to understand that you know this is a long period. So if you notice the front and the back legs, if you push them together conceptually, they wouldn't touch each other. And then the four um, images on the backs of the chairs are based on attributes of the four mothers. Um, and, and that was a very important thing to me that it wasn't, we don't know what the four mothers look like. So I, don't, I always get a kick out of the fact that if you look at early Christian art that shows you uh, Jesus, uh, he was not, he didn't have blonde hair. He was Semitic and he was Jewish. So, you know, I always get a kick out of everyone thinking that that's what it looks like. I didn't want to play that game with our Ima Oak. So I wanted to think about their attributes. So the, Images on the backs of the chairs are based on that. And the backs of the chairs are painted gold. So each of the children who are named can have their names on the back. So the attribute was the catalyst to an abstraction. And probably it's important to know that, that ambiguity and poetic ambiguity is, is an overriding, um, of overriding interest to Toby. So he is an artist of the text insofar as, and then it actually then gets a little Talmudic because it's about interpretation, it's about an endless cycle of interpretation whereby you're not trying to pin down a truth, but that the truth resides in, in a number of interpretations and that those are perpetual. So the abstraction is one that um, enables your imagination to go where it might go uh, without you know, dictating where it should go. Um, do I got the, do I have do I have that right? No. Perfect. We got it right. <laughs> okay. Next, please. Really lovely commission, and I was I was thinking, you know, that maybe half of one's career is based on having good collaborations and being able to do that which you really want to do. So this commission came up. Um, there is a precedent for it. So in the fifties, um, there was a dealer. Sam Coots, who um, enabled a number of his artists um, to do a commission, a synagogue commission in Melbourne, New Jersey. And they rose to the occasion nobly. Uh, it's an interesting commission. The Jewish Museum actually did an exhibition around it. Toby's a little bit different in the sense that I think a little more hands-on, a little more within the design of the fabric of the space. Uh, and Toby, maybe you could just talk about the paintings are inset into the walls. So when you walk into this space, um, every loving detail is touched by the artist. So the, the, the paintings are eight feet tall and five feet wide. And the near Tamid, the eternal light, is in that circular glass piece on the front. And the art doors are uh, carved wooden pieces based on the 70 carbon up. So everything I do, and I'm happy that Doug brought that up, I can't separate my yeshiva training from my art training. To me, they're the same exact thing. Like when I studied color theory at Hunter, all my teachers were Joseph Albert students. When I studied sacred texts in yeshiva, I was lucky enough to study with people that really cared about all of that. So I wanted, um, I wanted to, so in that circle, I, you know, the, an eternal light, the light has to fan all the time, but since they had just moved the synagogue, it was in the big field, people couldn't see 
the eternal light unless you saw it from, you came into the synagogue and I said, can we see how it looks from the highway? The architect said, are you insane? I said, no, no, I just want to see if you'll see anything from the highway, which is quite a bit away. And he goes, yeah, so we drove there and I said, you know what? I'm going to make a large eternal light that fits in the glass that's right above the Aaron Kodesh so that when people are can't find, now they can't, but again, they couldn't find the synagogue because it was a, down a long winding road. You can say, look for the circular light. That's the near time. It, that's how you'll find it. So that was the beginning of the whole design. Um, and then I wanted the art doors. I wanted, because this is a, this is amazing. It's a reformed synagogue with a conservative rabbi and orthodox at the time president. I thought that was amazing. Just, that's the deal. It's mergers of different synagogues. And I said, I want to have something that feels like the 70 pieces. So it looks like there are, there's 70 pieces on the doors. And those are two of the candelabras that were in the uh, Mishkan. It's not a menorah. It's, it's different. And again, three is how, you know, you can see the steps going up in there. And, that was really important for me. And as far as the paintings go, the only deal they said to me is you have to do it in white and gold and white and silver. We don't want any other colors in here. And I found that kind of intriguing, but it was a commission and I made it work. And I wanted it to be, they originally said we do things on the seven days of creation. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. But how about on creation? Like what does it mean? Like in Judaism, there are many forms of creation and let me do images based on that. And again, every commission you get when you do these large projects is always a committee. I was thrilled uh, to work with that and, and Doug knows. So I did images that were based on uh, birth. You know, that's the amnio of our, our middle daughter. You know, that first one on the, it's a photograph of what it looked like. And each one is different. Some are about science, some are about water, sky and water, some are about um, the blessing of the priest. I mean, I tried to incorporate, you know, all the images that told different forms of creation or interaction between God and man. The micro and the macro. Um, there's also this relationship between figure ground, which has always, um, always been intrigued by, where they're inextricably bound. You know, or, ordinarily the ground and the figure um, have a certain relationship, but it, and they sometimes square off against each other. They're sometimes not harmonically bound. But in Toby's work, there is this relationship that, and you can see it's more present in some paintings than in others. The uh, the stream that meanders through that endless road, uh, and the journey and the quest, the, the piece at the very far back on the left and the right that flank the um, the uh, bema. You you can't separate, and I find that's. I find that's very interesting. So the, the uniformity, the harmony, um, the um, it's it's whatever that bipolar part of the of our human character is is built into the very construction of the images, and I like that very much. I will also say that Nessa, did you write the text for in, in the Sacred Spaces book um, about some of the images? There's there's beautiful text, and I think some of some of the best writing that I've ever seen is Nessa's, and it's poetic. It doesn't at all aspire to pin down what you see, but rather uses that as the catalyst for another way of seeing it. Absolutely. I should say something else. You know, people until 1984, all my paintings and sculptures were abstract. Um, after I met Nessa, she, every, every name for all my work is based on language. But Nessa makes all the, um, I know we have to know it. Nessa makes all the, um, all the names of all my work, but they're based on Hebrew or other languages, but they're not real. Um, very poignant commission, to we've got about 10 minutes, so let's, uh, let's run through this, explain the iconography and, the, and what's actually present in the room and why. So um, in, in, when 9-11 happened, um, I was working with uh, Carol Bright Glass we, uh, we had founded Avoda Arts, and, and the Education Alliance had called me up to do a program with 
people who were children of first responders and people who had died, and I did a, a, a week-long project with um, the Education Alliance. Um, 10 years later, um, Walter Smith calls me up and says, Tony, we'd love you to do a project with us. And I said, wow, that's such a great idea. I'd love to meet those kids 10 years later. And he said, no, that's not the project. We're closing the building, and we want you to make a sacred space for in memory of 9-11. And I first said no, which I unfortunately do quite often. And, and then uh, I realized that it was an opportunity to do something that I thought was so important. I did a, a, a memorial piece right after 9-11, a, a shattered um, memorial light um, that I did for people that had died at 9-11. I've always made memorial lights, and I did one for 9-11. And, and I went down to the space and I realized I really, I want to do this. So I, I basically took off six months of my life to do this. And the most important thing for me, that the color of the walls you can't see, but it was that beautiful blue that was the day that 9-11 happened. The sky was just breathtaking. And again, I wanted to do something that was based on a, a Jewish approach to mourning 9-11. So there were different elements. The floor piece, which was later shown at the museum downtown, is made out of 10 segments. 10 is a minion, 10 segments of wood, and this is all remaindered wood. Why I kept it in my studio for 10 years, I don't know, but it was all from different projects I'd worked on. That was the center of it, now we go back to the other. On the wall, I wanted uh, seven yard side lights, uh, seven days of morning. I wanted seven of my shrines, but it was about using the two World Trade Center buildings as the beginning of it, and then as they fell, I made them, and, and the little sculpture inside was um, how you feel through the stages of mourning, you know, so, and then there were two Zabaka boxes, one for children of people who died, and one were, were children of first responders who died, and that is made out of a hundred, each one is made out of plaques that are all different size plaques with no names on them because people were still dying. So I wanted to have a plaque for each floor, and then there are quite a few people in the audience, I know Scott, and I know a lot of people on YouTube. I asked um, 220 people that I knew to make a small block, and I would give them the block, and I'd say, it's this big. I painted an ash white, and I said, you're part of my city, or Matthew, you did one too. I, I said, you're part of my city, I'm part of your city. I want you to write down your memory of, it's so powerful. Can you raise your hands how many people, there are a lot of people in this room, look at that, this is unbelievable. And so, yeah, Matthew, you did too. Um, so all of you people did blocks. The reason I did that is I didn't want it to be just how I thought of 9-11. I wanted it to be of different people. And then it was really annoying to me. Somebody said to me, what happens if someone doesn't give it back to you? And I said, everyone's going to give it back to me. Then I got neurotic. And, and <laughs> I made two substitutes that I would call anonymous, but I didn't need to use them, so they're still in my studio. So 220 people each did a block. That's on the other wall. And what's so powerful is we had many student groups coming by, and that's the part that the kids were, that all the other stuff they liked with the individual blocks, I had white gloves out for people, and people would, you know, hold the blocks and see what different people read. Excellent. Let's finish with the, um, you know, the last um, question would be around how one carries um, sacred space in, in their mind. And, your, your work as a catalyst to bring an awareness to something that then becomes a part of who you are um, and less visible, less tangible, more cerebral and um, body. I just want to say that I want to end with the last panel because I, I was so impressed with the, the way they talked about what the show up, what the Holocaust is, and what about anti Semitism is, is today. I also believe you should keep that in your mind, but I also believe all human beings are born in Salomel or Kim, which means in the, in the image of God. And I also believe that Salomel, 
who was, you know, people always say, who did God speak to? He spoke to Moses, but he also spoke to Betzalel. He was an architect slash artist. So I think you should be able to carry with you some sort of sacred space. And I think it's important that each person carries their own sacred space. Meaning, I'm a visual thinker. Words don't do the same thing for me as it does for many people. An image does. And you know, when I heard Richard talk about how the angels come from this painting and other people, and you know, I mean, everyone talks about the things that touch them as artists. I think we all have visual experiences in our life that stay with us. And if you can tap into that, um, always it is such a gift. And I don't know if you know the Jewish Healing Center, um, uh, Rabbi Rachel Cowan, there were four rabbis and one uh, poet. And that's what it's one of them, about being able to find Jewish mantras to keep with you in your life. I think a sacred space is a great thing to keep in your mind, and it doesn't have to be a painting, sculpture, it could be anything. Thank you very much.